Philippe Grandi, welcome. Uh, this conversation will be uncut. Uh, we'll talk for 20 minutes, and the viewers will see exactly what we say with no editing at all. Wonderful. So let me begin by saying, is there still a migration crisis facing Europe? Has there ever been one? You know, I, I understand why one has to be careful when you speak about these matters. But frankly, when you look at the figures, and let's look at our figures, refugees, displaced people, about 70 million worldwide, mm -hmm. 85 to 90 percent are not in Europe, are not in America, are not in Australia. They are in poor or middle income countries. So that's where the crisis is. Now, of course, we have seen people arriving in Europe at some stage in large numbers. That was critical. Uh, it was not handled well. That made the crisis more acute. And uh, it has then been politicized, which made it irreversibly acute. The politicians certainly thought it was a crisis. And they've treated it like a crisis. And for some politicians themselves, it became a crisis for, for them, including Angela Merkel in Germany. The problem is, and certainly I don't blame Angela Merkel, who did, in my opinion, the right thing, showed that Europe still had, still put value in solidarity. But uh, the problem was, was that when she made that famous statement that Syrians would be welcome in, in, uh, in Germany, and let's not forget, Syrians were fleeing an atrocious war at that time. When she made that statement, the rest of Europe didn't follow. The rest of Europe didn't share that responsibility with Germany. She was left alone. That was the problem. And the message the politicians seem to take from that, though, is that here was Angela Merkel went out on a limb uh, and welcomed in a million refugees or migrants, or whatever they were. She was the most powerful leader in Europe. And it pretty much destroyed her political career. That's the message the rest of Europe took. In other words, we're not going to do that. Surely. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the, the, what, where I would disagree is to attribute to her that failure when the failure must be attributed to the inability of Europe to deal with these matters. And my point is also that Europe must deal with those matters, A, because Europe has a duty to receive people fleeing war and persecution. So that's not a choice, in my opinion. That's a European value. That's a European obligation, also according to international law. But in doing so, Europe must be more organized. And this is where we come back to the politicization. It's become so politicized that every little boat wandering in the Mediterranean with 20 people becomes a European drama. Or on the English Channel. Or on the Where the Channel. Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force are and, and, scrambled. And you've certainly noticed that nowadays in Europe, the race is um, about who does the least about uh, uh, accepting these people and dealing with them, rather than a, a race for generosity. It's quite the opposite. This is absurd. Also, so it's it a race to do as little as possible. As little yes, as sir. possible and give the responsibility to others because it has become politically toxic. And that's, you know, it, it, that's a vicious circle, this discourse. Let's look at the scale of the problem and then it's what's happening and some of the possible solutions of political responses. The, the numbers are way down on 2015 when Angela Merkel faced... Way down. Way down. Uh, it moved to, along the Mediterranean, but there are also about 85% down crossing the Mediterranean in, into Italy, Italy as well. So they're down. But last year, 117,000 migrants still reached Europe by sea overwhelmingly Italy, Spain and Greece. 200 died in the process. It's still a major problem, unresolved. Of course it is a major problem because I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. When I say that it is not a crisis, I can also say it's not a crisis compared to what Lebanon or Bangladesh are facing with much less resources than Europe. And much bigger numbers. And much bigger, much bigger numbers. It is a crisis in so much as one death 
in the Mediterranean, in my opinion, is a crisis, mm -hmm. especially in Europe, that has a duty to rescue these people. But once again, you know, to organize rescue, to share disembarkation, to share, to reform the asylum system so it's not the the countries at the edge that have to deal with all the problems, as it is now Greece, Italy, now we see Spain. To do all this, you need some cohesion, working together and depoliticizing the whole phenomenon. Well, ju let's just look at how that's not happening. I mean, as we speak, there's a boat, Sea Watch 3. It's a rescue ship. It's rescued 50 migrants. It's been refused entry into Lampedusa, the Italian island closest to the Libyan coast. It's now heading for Malta. We don't know if Malta's going to take it either. Malta feels a we're a little country. island, we yeah. have to take too many. We're on, you say, on the front line. What happens to these people? Well, we have seen it now in the past, what, three, four months, several cases like that. Uh, the last one uh, were those two boats around Christmas time that were wandering in the Mediterranean, difficult conditions for about three weeks. Three weeks, 49 people, talking of a continent of 500 million people, one of the richest parts of the world. So but, but what is the problem? The problem, in the end, a solution was found. Se seven, eight countries decided to share that responsibility. That's good, because I agree with the Italians or the Greeks before, or the Spaniards now, that it should not be just one country receiving them all. But you need to have a system that works, that, that is in place. You, right. Otherwise, it becomes a negotiation that in the present climate is very difficult. And this was an ad hoc solution as well. Total, and it will be for this boat. Mm -hmm. I can make a bet with Rather you. Rather than a yes. strategy or policy. Well, let's look at one of the pol policies. Operation Sophia has, has been the naval, the European naval exercise uh, patrolling in the Mediterranean. It saved some 50,000 people since uh, 2015. It's cracked down on people smugglers as well. It looks as if Operation Sophia, which is run by the Italians, but it contains many European navies, navies, including the Germans, it's being scaled back and it may come to an end. What yeah. do you say to that? I'm worried because, you know, um, and it's not just Operation Sophia, which has already been scaled back last year, by the way. It's, um, it's in general, the rescue mechanism in the Mediterranean. You know, uh, the NGOs played a very big role in that. And the NGOs have been attacked publicly, have been criticized, have been limited in their scope of action. They've been accused of fomenting, of increasing trafficking, whilst the NGOs in reality perform an indispensable job together with national coast guards and uh, Sofia sh ships in, in rescuing people whom, according not to, the, to refugee law or migration rules according to the law of the sea which is very ancient goes back to the 17th century we have a duty and is global and is global you know this is part of humankind saving people that are in distress at sea and uh, but now we seem to be cutting back rather than getting the coherent yeah, response even the germans are telling us because that their ships are being sent by the italians to areas where there are no refugees. Yes. You know, the, 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 what we have seen is, as you said earlier and correctly, we've seen a decrease in the numbers of people arriving, a sharp decrease, in fact. But the percentage of those dying is increasing in, mm. in prorated to the numbers of arrivals. We've had a number of deaths this year. Yeah. Even it's on the it's actually, numbers. you know, between 2017 and 18, the percentage of those that we estimate having lost their lives has doubled, which means that there are less rescues. That's, you know, leave aside every other consideration because I do fully realize the complexity of this problem. This is absolutely unacceptable, unacceptable, especially for Europe. And I speak here as a European, not just as a High Commissioner for Refugees. You have said that the, these movements, the migrant and refugee movement. You said, and I quote you words, they should be managed in a principled and pragmatic way. That's fine. But what would that mean in practice? In practice, it means having a, what we would call an asylum system that works better. First of all, a better distribution of arrivals, like I said, not just in a few countries. And second, a system that is more efficient and rapid in adjudicating who is a refugee and who is not. We've made countless proposals to the European Union to adopt better systems. We are the ones who 
are promoting a very solid system with safeguards, but we're also telling them you ha it has to be efficient. Otherwise, people stay for a long time and then it loses impact and value. And then, of course, and this is difficult, you have to have a system so that those that are not recognized as refugees um, enter a different track. They are migrants, and migration is absolutely legitimate, but it has another logic and another dynamic, and some people may have to be returned to their homes, and that is not working. There is no functioning agreements between European countries and countries from, which, from where these people are coming. So this is very complex. I am not for a moment underestimating the complexity of all this, but to do this, because of the complexity, Europe needs to be united. And around this, there is no unity at the moment. A lot of people, though, think it's getting harder and harder in this modern world to make a distinction between a refugee, on which there are le legal obligations of asylum, if it's a proper refugee, and an economic migrant, that someone that just wants to try and get away from a better life. They may feel unsafe in the country they're coming from, too, but they're not quite refugees and they see better prospects. Why would you blame them? but that the distinction is blurred and doesn't work anymore. I, I would uh, agree with part of the argument, and I would agree that it has become more difficult to make that distinction, um, not because people don't flee for very valid reasons, all of them, in fact, or move for very valid reasons, but because there's a lot of mix of reasons. Some people move for a variety of reasons. Take the Venezuelans, just to move away from Europe. I was there in October and it was very interesting. You know, Venezuelans are leaving their countries in enormous numbers. About three we million, est I we estimate about three million have left in the last yeah. couple of years. And they move for reasons that range from not being able to put food in the ta on the table for their children to political persecution yeah. and everything in between. So I, you know, it is difficult, but I would say that in cases of, when you judge these cases, you have to err on the side of caution mm -hmm. because returning people to their country that may face danger, risk to their lives, is something that we cannot face. And this is where you define the benchmarks for international protection. And then there's different types of international protection that you can provide to people, you know, temporary protection, humanitarian protection, refugee status, which is the most solid. So I think that those distinctions are still valid and important if we want to preserve the institution of asylum, but they need investment, they need discussion, and again, they need unanimity in Europe to be applied consistently. And one of Europe's policy responses has been to put money into Libya, where a lot of the migrants and refugees uh, leave Africa to set out for Europe across the Mediterranean, uh, to put them into camps, to help finance the camps, to return them to the camp sometime if they're picked up on, in the sea. Uh, and everything I read is that these camps in Libya are hell holes. Yeah, I've been in those camps, I can And am I right? You. You're absolutely right. You know, I said recently, and it was reported, and I want to repeat it, that if I were a refugee or a migrant or a person, let's say like that, a person in one of these camps, I would take any risk to get out of them, mm -hmm. including, because they know very well, crossing the sea, which is very life-threatening. But they're so awful and so dangerous and so humiliating for people that uh, it is understandable. Now, I have to say something. When you said about putting money into Libya, you know, if uh, the international community invested properly in Libya, it wouldn't be a bad thing. First, resolving the conflict, which badly needs an end, because that's the source of all other problems in Libya, right? And then, of course, reconstructing the country. The problem is that most of the resources seem to be put in one aspect of the Libyan institution, the Coast Guard. Why? Because the Coast Guard controls the coast, and that serves Europe's purpose to limit the arrival. To, to stop them now, coming in across. in itself, you know, this is a good thing to reinforce the Coast Guard and rescue people along the coast. The problem is that if you don't address everything else, as you say, what ends up happening is that people are disembarked in Libya, they're put back uh, into this detention centre, and then we have to start again the process of trying to have access, pulling them out, rescuing some of them, et cetera, et cetera. But I was looking at 144 refugees and or migrants uh, rescued by a cargo ship, but they were then taken uh, to a detention centre in Misrata 
in northwest Libya. And there have been stories in these centres of torture, sexual attacks, extortion, forced labour. Uh, I mean, that surely cannot be a European migration policy. Surely not. But uh, it is also true that uh, we have to look at the problem realistically. There are tens of thousands of people stranded in Libya. And clearly not all of them can come to Europe. That's clear. Um, and you know, many of them want to go back to their countries if they're not refugees. You know, people that have moved for economic reasons, they realize that it's too difficult and dangerous. They want to go back. Now, a year ago about, um, the International Organization for Migration, a, a, a fellow agency, yes. Our yes, staff, I read some of the have started working there. We've managed to make a bit of progress. Uh, IOM um, flies back people that accept to go, to go back to their countries. And for those who cannot because they are refugees, we help them get out of Libya. But it's still a fraction of the total. However, if we could expand that work, that would be useful because that would be giving them protection in Libya, safety out of Libya, in a manner that doesn't expose them to trafficking and the dangers of crossing the sea. But to do that, we need more space. In Libya, the space is limited. A lot of these centers that you're talking about are not actually run by the authorities. They're run by militias. Yes. These militias, one should not imagine them as big political groups. They're just criminals. They're just gangs that money. are profiting from all sorts of trafficking, including of people. That's Libya, High Commissioner. But 500 people have just been ousted from a refugee reception centre close to Rome by the Italian government. Not Libya, not North Africa, in Europe, close to one of Europe's greatest cities. I mean, I don't want to be too depressing here, but if you look at these, and, and I think these stories do, uh, they help to, to really humanise it. It tells you what's really happening. It's hard to be optimistic. Well, may, may I maybe slightly say it differently? They help, they help humanizing by highlighting how dehumanizing these policies have become. Yes, you know, the, this is the result. What happened in Italy uh, is, the res, is the result of a new law that the government has passed. Now, we have said, I've been very public, we have said to the government that that law was would not be good for the people that it was supposed to protect and help. And it would cause more problems, especially shortening the support that is given to people that are asylum seekers and so forth, not allowing them to have access to these centers. The situation was not perfect before. No. It needed improvement, but this is a step backwards, not a step forward. Now, your agency, I think it was one of your people, not you yourself, but it said politicians must stop using human beings for political point scoring, which is a pretty fair uh, thing to say. But I would suggest to you that the European elections coming up, in which migration is going to be at the core, in which populist parties are going to be calling the shots, that that is precisely what is going to happen and that this will get worse before it gets better. Unfortunately, I agree with you. And I think it is actually, you know, I wouldn't be worried if migration was in focus. It's important. Mm. It's, it's an important global issue that needs to be addressed to properly. Talk, to talk but debate. you have to address it seriously, not just uh, making a, you know, having a hype about who will get the next 20 people on a boat, because that's the migration debate. What, that's what the migration debate is reduced to. Instead of being a debate about the root causes of how people move, political causes, conflict, economy, climate change, and so forth. That's the type of migration discussion that Europe should have and it is not having. So all we have to do at this point is to hope that these elections come and go and we enter a phase in which we can resume that serious discussion. Europe deserves it, Europeans deserve it, and millions of people on the move certainly deserve it. Well, we know you have to come and go because you have a busy schedule here. Filippo Grandi, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.